Hello to my fellow food service community from my sunny Orange County, California studio. Nick Portillo here, and this is the Titans of Food Service. You like that? So today I wanted to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, something very exciting. It's my company, Portillo Sales and Marketing. It's nearly our nine year anniversary. So this episode here is we're in April of 2024. And we started our business in June of 2015. So kind of kind of surreal that surreal that we've made it nine years. And we when we first started out, <laughs> it was so rough, man. It's crazy to think that we're we've made it nine years. It's been, I mean, this journey has been full of highs, it's been full of lows, and it's been full of a lot of in-between those two extremes. But it has definitely been worth it and it's been a lot of fun. My dad and I, we started it together on the same day. He had been in the food broker business for the majority of his career. So he worked he was a division vice president for a company called Food Sales West, which was a large broker. And by the way, I know I've, I've told the story probably a million times on this podcast, but for those who don't know, I'm just rehashing and then we'll get to the meat and potatoes of the conversation. So Food Sales West, majority of his career, that rolled up into Advantage Waypoint. He had a couple year deal there, took a one year break, worked at a customer, and then approached me to start Portillo Sales and Marketing six days after I graduated from college. So we started the business together on the same day. We own it 50-50 and have since the beginning, uh, which is kind of a sidebar. Food Sales West became Advantage Waypoint. Advantage Waypoint is no longer, well, eventually became Waypoint and no longer is in existence as they merged with uh, Key Impact creating Action Food Service. So kind of crazy to see it come full circle here and uh, you know, wish, wish that team and, and that company the best. But <clears throat> Anyway, back to us. <laughs> Just kidding. So starting in June of 2015, six days after graduating, and nothing could prepare you from, or should I say for, nothing could prepare you for an entrepreneurial journey, truly. the It is mixed with a lot of highs, a lot of lows, and mostly a bunch of in between those two things. Nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems is, is what I always, that's my, like, that's always my, my saying. Um, so there's a lot that happens in the middle, but you have to enjoy the highs and just really grind through and, and work through the lows. That's just, that's just kind of a general statement. Now I'm just talking in generalized statements. However, I wanted to talk today about some of the things that I've learned along the way and some of the things that we've implemented that have made us successful. So first things first is obviously it's my dad and I, when we started it together, a lot of businesses start with just a single founder or there's multiple partners. I really like now my experience is just having two founders, but I really like uh, having two, two initial people starting in the business. It brings diversity of thought, strengths, weaknesses. One person may be good at in one area where it's a weakness for another. So you complement one another. Also too, in our situation, it, you know, he had all the relationships to start, but as our business has grown, we've built different relationships. So he has relationships with people over here. I have relationships with people over there. We have a lot of similar relationships, but it just expands our reach as a business. Now that there's two of us, um, which makes it nice also too. When you have another person going through the exact same experience and trying to grow the same thing as you, so so long as you can communicate and get along and be on the same page, it's a, a big benefit. You can um, <clears throat> you can enjoy in the wins together, but you can also work through the losses together, which I think is important. You have a shared experience with somebody in entrepreneurship. It's hard to explain to somebody who has not done entrepreneurship, what it really feels like. There is many moments where you feel alone. It's very, there's a lot of moments where you like just simple on a week to week basis, month to month basis, where it's hard to sleep and, and you think about things. So when you can share that responsibility with somebody else, it really helps. I'm not saying that a business starts with three or four people uh, as the founders is wrong. You know, when I look at that type of business, you know, I think it's possible, but there's a lot more mouths to feed, especially in the early stages. And so you can people, you can have people who fall off. If you have just a single founder, a lot of responsibility is on the shoulders 
of one individual person, which makes it very difficult, especially in the food broker business. Do brands want to hire somebody, at least initially, it's just initially, you know, one person, I think your, your time to start up and grow the business, you can very well get to the level of wherever you want to go, but having one person, I think it's going to take a little bit longer than if you had two. That's just from my own bias perspective. So <clears throat> that's that. When you're first starting off, you need to, or we needed to convince people to overcome the fact that we were new and that it's okay to change. People want to partner and be with winners. They want people, they want to partner and be with people who have been around, who have done it, who they have, they have confidence in to grow their business. For us, we had no track record. We had no history. We had nothing. It was really just my dad and I. So overcoming new and change took some time. A lot of times, I think entrepreneurs, they fall off or don't make it because they can't wait long enough to overcome those two things. For example, when we started our business, our initial clients were brands that I, most of them aren't even around anymore. They're out of business. They didn't make it. We just were doing pro bono projects. We were trying to build a name out there slowly but surely. It took me 10 months from day one when I started in June of 2015 to make my first paycheck. 10 months. If you have, you know, everybody has a different um, personal, what am I trying to say? A, a different, uh, let's just say home life. For me, I was 22 years old. And so my responsibilities, my accountability to other people, especially financially, was limited. I was living at home with mom and dad, baby. My dad was in a different spot. You know, he had a family and he was the main breadwinner. And so from going from having a an income, a nice solid income with his previous employer to zero, there's a lot of pressure there. And how long can you go without money coming in until you say, I can't do this. It's not going to work. So again, you have to hang on long enough for people to overcome new and change. And that's specifically within a service business. I'm talking from the lens of a service business. There's other types of businesses out there. For example, there is intellectual property businesses, there are product businesses. Let's take a pro uh, some differences between product and service. In a service type business like ours, you don't need heavy capital up front to get started. It's really, in our case, it was we had to buy a computer, a couple of computers, we had to buy a phone, we had to pay for gas to go out and see customers. You know, really those are not ticky tacky expenses, but they they weren't heavy ex expenditures. I mean, it felt heavy at the time because we had no money coming in. However, you overcome those types of things. And so you can really uh, set up your business um, through the state, through the government and get rolling pretty quickly. On the flip side, let's say you're in a product business and you want to um, produce a product. Well, first you're, you're gonna need capital upfront. You're gonna need investors. Potentially people that can put money into you to help develop the product, to help produce the product, and then help to get that product out. So you may need heavy capital up front. Think about, and here's an example. Think about a food manufacturer. You're going to need money up front, even if you go to have someone that will uh, co-pack it for you, you're going to need dollars up front to be able to pay for that. Me and our type business, we don't have that. Or take an intellectual property business or an IT company or, or a tech company like an Uber, right? To develop that app, it doesn't just come out of thin air. You have to spend a lot and a lot and a lot of money to be able to de develop the, the IT, to develop the app, to create the concept, the branding, the marketing, all of those types of things, that's millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars up front just for a hope and a wish. But the difference between that type of business, like Uber and my business, is Uber is much easier to scale. 
at some point they're they're not adding more expense into the app to acquire more customers or to excuse me not to acquire more customers to service more customers you can have people all across the world just download the app they log in and they start using it and for the for uber there's not necessarily an additional cost to that for me there is a cost to it as a service business i'm not looking it, it's very 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 difficult to scale a service business when i bring in a new client potentially they might be paying me seven figures a year and so i need to take those dollars and reinvest it back into my business i need to hire in this case i'm a labor intensive business so i need to hire more headcount and so or is Uber where they can get their expenses? And I'm drawing like a, a, a line here with my hands for those who are listening all along on Spotify or Apple podcast, whatever. At, at some point their expenses stop and their revenue continues to grow. That's scale, right? So they're going to have a large Delta in between the revenue and the expenses for me, expenses and revenue, they go up. Now, granted, you want revenue to go up faster than expenses, but expenses are still going up even as you acquire more uh, clients or customers because you need the dollars to invest back into their business. So a little bit different types of styles of business, especially when it comes to selling a, a company. If you were to sell a product business, you can maybe have higher profit margins and an investor would look at your you know, your, your, your EBITDA or your bottom line, whatever it may be and say, Hey, this company is making $10 million in, in net income. And I can see over a period of time that I, <clears throat> that being that they already have scale, I can make my money back because investors look at not necessarily return on capital, it's return of capital. That's the key. Whereas a service business, like, like a food broker business, it's harder to sell. In the food broker business, a lot of times, if someone is going to sell their business, they sell it to somebody who will pay a percentage of the total dollar. Let's say they're going to pay you a million dollars and maybe up front, they'll say, I'll give you 10 to 15%. So in this case, a hundred to 115,000 up front, but you need to stay within the business for a couple of years to ensure that the transition works. And so they'll pay the rest of the money over two, three, four years. Um, which requires the founder or the owner to stay in the business. I feel like I'm going off on a weird tangent here, but this is just kind of how the broker math works. Um, as your business starts to grow and as you get cash flow <coughs> into the business, you need to invest those dollars. But initially, when you go from day one, when we started in June 2015, to making our first million, in, in commissions, which took us about a, I think about a year or so to get to that point. It was really a lot of my dad and I doing the business. We do the sales, we do the admin, we do the marketing, we do the accounting, we do everything in between. It's a lot of work. It's wearing a lot of different hats. It's putting us into uh, professional positions that we're not necessarily great at. We're great at maybe one or two. And then the rest, eh, you know, maybe okay here, terrible over here. I think when you look at a business too, of the successful ones, especially in the broker business, you have to have somebody that understands the financials of the business. A lot of times it may just be a really stud sales professional. They have no idea how to manage a P and L or a balance sheet or cash flow statement anything. They just don't know how to do that. And they just kind of willy nilly about the, about the, uh, <laughs> about the money, which is not good for a broker business. The way we look at our, our, how we've looked at our business since day one is we do the, the accounting side of our business is on a cash basis. So dollar in versus dollar out, it reports right on our PL and our balance sheet immediately right there. It tells you how much money has come in or out of the business. When we forecast and invest back into our business, we don't do it on a cash basis. We look at it on a more of an accrual basis. And what I mean by that is looking at it in terms of this is how much I expect to make in revenue and based on future expectations or 
uh, even over the next three months, this is how many dollars I feel comfortable investing back into the business. Really, in, in our case, labor, hiring more people. It's important to do that. A lot of brokers, you'll have one, ex one side where they are investing more than they're making. At some point, they run out of steam or they are barely making any money, which which drives the, the founder into the ground. It's very stressful to run a business that way. Or you have the exact opposite a spectrum where they where it's private equity and they try to strip as many dollars out of that business as humanly possible, not invest them back in. So there's really a balance where based on your revenue, you invest at a, a level that you're comfortable with. But again, it's a service business. It's all about cash flow. Scale is very difficult to achieve. You need to be in the cash flow side of things. So very important. As I was mentioning, going from zero to a million, you do it all yourself. As you start to get into seven, seven figures, this is in terms of revenue. You need to look at what are the things that I can buy to buy back some of my time. For example, to level up, to get from, let's say, one to three million, you really are looking at maybe two, three key hires that will help you get to that level. There's different, going back to levels, there's different levels that um, within your business to buy back your time five different things that I've really seen in my experience. Number one is the first thing you start to buy back your time with is admin. You need customer service people, you need admin people that take for, in my example, uh, ordering samples or processing orders or taking care of follow-up, those types of thing, administrative work, that's the first thing that you replace to buy back your time. First, as your business grows, the next thing you wanna look at, especially in the food broker business, is replacing you on the sales side. If you were going out and making all of the sales calls on the business, which is what we did in the very beginning, so I would go out and I present our clients' products to the operators or distributors, which I still do, I still do, I still very much enjoy it, but it can't be, the success of my clients cannot be based on what I personally go out and do. So I need to hire salespeople around me to help with that part of the business. As I get time back, so now I'm doing less admin, I'm doing maybe less sales. And this is me personally, not the business. On the business side, we're because we're hiring people and teams to take care of those things. We're doing more admin than we've ever done before. We're doing more sales than we've ever done before. So the third level of, of replacement is around marketing, taking care of maybe it's social media marketing, or maybe it's marketing my, my clients' products to the trade, those types of things. So hiring a marketing person or a marketing team, that is, that's kind of the third part or how, you know, essentially finding uh, buying back your time and getting your company message out to the marketplace. That's the third, that's the third level. So again, we're doing more admin, we're doing more sales, we're doing more marketing, and I'm just doing less of those things. Me personally, not the business. The fourth one is the management team. As I stopped doing admin, as I stopped doing sales, as I stopped doing marketing, not all together, but it's significantly reducing the time that I put into any one of those categories. It's really meta management. So managing the team, me as a human, a weakness of mine is management. I'm not a great people manager, not, not something I'm comfortable with. I've had to do it and I've become better at it, but I think just my personality type and, and I'm not a manager. There's other areas I've strengthened. That is not one of them. So it's replacing yourself with a management team that is better than you, that can handle admin, sales, marketing. So if you look at the levels, it's admin, sales, marketing, management replacement. And then the final one, which we have not personally gotten to, is replacing you, the leadership team. Replacing, finding somebody like C-suite level people 
that can make the decisions for the company, drive the company forward. Uh, so that'll be a frontier that we we look to um, achieve at some point in the future, far into the future. Um, because when you do that, it just allows you as the entrepreneur to, you could pull the best parts of you and pour it back into the business. So I'm not getting tied down with admin. And on the admin side, we have incredible people. They, they love that role. They love being uh, in an ad administrative position. So you have to find people that enjoy that business and do it a hundred times better than you could or ever did do. It's very important to grow the business. A downfall of startup businesses, service business, even food brokers, especially food brokers, let me say that, especially food brokers, is you have to have more meetings with your team. As you would layer in more team members into your business, a lot of times people are like, oh, I just can't do another meeting. It needs to be the opposite. You need to be meeting with your team on a weekly or very consistent basis. Because when you're not meeting with you with your team, you're shouldering more of the responsibility and you're creating a, bo a communication bottleneck within your business. It's important to have meetings. You have to take the time to do those types of things to grow your company and move it forward. You have to take what's in your brain and share it across the team. The team needs to take what's in their brain and share it across the team. That's how you stay on track of achieving your mission and your vision. Very important, very important to have more meetings. There are certain functions within a business that you should outsource, especially in a service business. I may not need a CFO. I can hire a fractional CFO. So it's a fractional CFO. So for our business, for the longest time, my dad was writing checks and processing uh, invoices and things like that. Even walking out every day to the mailbox to grab our checks tied them into our system, tear off the checks, file the, the commission backup, drive it over to the bank. Too many steps, too many steps. So now we've outsourced all of the accounting. So essentially someone handling our books. We've outsourced uh, building out budgets, forecasts. We've outsourced to someone paying all of our things like payroll, expenses, invoices, all of those types of things. We have someone that goes out to the mailbox, grabs the checks, processes them through. And we recently got a, uh, um, what is it even called? Like a check. It's through our bank. They give us this check machine. So now we can just, instead of driving to the bank and depositing the checks, we just run it through this machine. So that process of all of those different app, paying bills, going to get the checks, adding the commission statements back into the right folders in our company, taking all the checks to the bank, all of those types of things, which takes hours every week, hours, no longer have to do those things. So that's just one part of our business that we've been able to outsource to a third party to handle for us. And by outsourcing to a third party, it's less than if we were to hire a chief financial officer, a chief operating officer, and taking, instead of investing those dollars into high salary individuals, we don't put those dollars back into really what drives our economic engine, which is um, selling cases. We need dollars going towards selling more, more, more cases. As we've grown as well, it's become less about what my dad and I can do. Same, similar thing. A lot of times with new brokers or broker companies in general, they're selling the owner or the manager, whoever, or the leadership, whoever is making that presentation, because I've seen it a million times and I'd interview, interview against these, these types of businesses all the time, is they're interviewing themselves as me as the owner. Look what I can do. I have relationships. I have the customers that can grow your business. And that is what we used to do when we first started off is, hey, I have a relationship over here with uh, Chuck at some restaurant chain. No, no, no. You could have those relationships. You could talk about those relationships, but it's less about selling yourself as the worker. It's, you have to sell the business as the solution. So again, it's less about selling you as the business, 
but selling the business as the solution. Very important. At the more and more we did this business, we understood exactly who, what our message was and who our core customer was. And we built our story around that and how we can help them. Not what I can do, but what we can do as a business um, and has really helped us grow. I know when sitting across the table from a, from a manufacturer client, a potential one, I know exactly which ones would be that I handle and work with the best in terms of when I say I, our business, that these types of companies or clients fall exactly into the niche that we have. So it's on us as the presenter to one, that person needs to trust you, but you need to, you need to give your company's story or your brand's story in a clear and concise way that makes sense to them. Cause you know, in your head that they are perfect for what you do. They fall perfectly into your niche and you have to be able to tell that story. Communication is very key to be able to sell that story. You have to build your culture. You have to hire people that fit your culture. Going back to what I said about hiring key, having key hires as you move up the, the income scale, those people have to fit the culture first. There's lots of people out there that can sell millions and millions of cases or thousands of cases or hundreds of thousands of cases, but do they fit your culture? You need to build your culture first and then everything else will fall into line. I guarantee it. If you have a place that people want to come and work and they're proud of the work that they do, they'll stick around longer. If they stick around longer. You have to do less training. There's less turnover. There's less expense to you as the business when you can retain employees and team members. Very important to the longevity and health of a business. Another thing in the food broker business that I wanted to touch on too is around embracing, you have to embrace change as well innovation, uh, technology, current trends. There's a lot of brokers out there that just refuse, just refuse to change. You have to be evolving. That's how you stick around longer. I think it's Jeff Bezos. Always, he knows when, as time is am at Amazon, that at some point Amazon will not, will cease to exist. Somebody will come in, some other business, and at some point in the future, maybe a hundred years from now, maybe a thousand years from now, maybe five years from now but somebody will replace Amazon. So his vision was always, I have to just survive, you know, building long-term to last for as long as I possibly can. The food broker business is the same. If you're doing today what you did 20 years ago and haven't changed, that's, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. If you're a business that's a multi-generational business that's been doing this since the 60s and nothing has changed, you could be in trouble. You're vulnerable. It's important to be able to evolve, evolve. Going back to, you know, when we started our business trying to convince potential clients to overcome new and change, you too have to overcome your own biases, embrace, embrace new and embrace change. Incredibly, incredibly important. Now, when it comes to investing in your business, invest in the things that buy back your time and or make you more money. Going back to the example of processing invoices and going out to the mailbox, that is something to invest in to buy back your time. It doesn't necessarily, me going to the mailbox faster than, than I did yesterday doesn't make me any more money, but it does buy back my time so that I could put that time towards high income producing activities. Also, on the flip side, investing your the dollars that you make back into whatever functions of the business that can make you more money. Maybe it's hiring another salesperson who has relationships that can add in new sales. Maybe it's investing, if you're a certain, a different type of business, investing in new equipment that can create more products that's going to make you more money. Maybe it's a, a, hiring a marketing person that can broadcast your message and build better brand awareness that makes you more money. On the broker business, when it comes to treating your clients, this is a very difficult thing to do in an area where a lot of brokers fail or could do better in, not necessarily fail, but could do better in. First, you have to be responsive. If someone sends you an email, respond. You don't have to respond right then and there. It could be within 24 hours. If anything, make it within the week. You have to be responsive. If your client sends you a message and you never respond or you never call them back, 
the assumption is you're not that important. Be responsive, first and foremost. Within your response or within your correspondence or within your communication to your clients, you have to take a general interest in them as people and as business professionals. You have to be curious and open and have a thirst for learning more about them and their business because that goes a long way. People want to be seen. They want to be heard. So empathy is very, very, very important. When it comes to communicating with them, approach every situation with kindness and listening first. Empathy first. Very important. There's many times where clients say or do something that can make your blood boil. This is a people business, okay? <laughs> We're dealing with people. If something doesn't sit right with you, a lot of times it's better, this is my experience, for, for whether it's right or wrong, to internalize it, sleep on it. If it really got my blood boiling, I will sleep on it for a couple days at least to let it sit in. You know, when you, you're sitting there with your head on the pillow and you're just thinking about like, oh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to give back to this person and, and, and really stick it to them. Don't do that. Don't do that. This is your client. They're paying money for a service and they expect whatever they expect. So your response to them has to be appropriate. Always lead with empathy. Listen first, follow with empathy. Very important. They always say the customer is right. In the food broker business, your client, they hire you as the expert. They are not necessarily always right. It's important to approach them with ideas or different perspectives or various ways to approach a problem, an issue, an opportunity. They may not know. For me, our business, we're in California. We are the experts on food service sales and marketing in California. We're the experts in Nevada. We're the experts in Hawaii. Their expectation is that we take their business and run with it. They may, a, a client may have one way of doing it, but it's important to say, hey, this is collaboration. This is a partnership. We need to have clear communication and we need to work towards a common goal. So it's important to have that collaboration with one another. Now, not every client is the same. You have ones that are like, you, you can picture in your head like, that is my ideal client. You'll have others where their expectations far exceed the dollars that they pay you. This is a weird spot to be as a business because you wanna service everybody to the highest level that you possibly can. But if, if a certain client is costing you significantly more money than they're paying, you are essentially taking the money from other clients that are paying you to try to appease this one. Not a good move. Strongly consider removing that relationship because you have a business to run. The second one is going back to the culture of the business. Building your culture is incredibly important. Hiring and retaining employees long-term is very important. If you have clients that deteriorate that culture or take away from it or treat people on your team in a way that you don't treat them or wouldn't expect them to be treated or treat yourself, have a conversation with, the, again, it's the people business, but it's important to have that conversation. And if you're not aligned, that's okay. That's okay. But it's important to move on from that relationship. If you want to continue to build a strong and resilient business, you have to sometimes make the tough decisions to depart to to depart from those uh, types of relationships. And finally, this is my last thing: is a lot of people jump into the food broker business and they want to do it differently. They don't want to be called brokers. They don't want to. They want to be called. I don't even know agencies or, or whatever, like the fancy word is, we're not a broker. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's already been invented for you. If you look at a wheel, you have different spokes, right? Just choose one of the spokes on the wheel to be the best in the world at. You're going to need the whole wheel. You're going to need, you're going to need to be able to process orders. You're going to need to be able to work food shows. You're going to need to go out and drag the bag and make new sales. Those types of things you're going to have to do. I call that the basic blocking and tackling of the industry. But maybe within one of those categories, and maybe in technology or marketing or innovation or something, you can be the absolute freaking best in the world 
where no one is better than you. And over time, your customers and the people in the industry will talk about how freaking good you are in that one area. And it's going to spread like wildfire. I promise you, the longer you do this, it will get out. And now going back again, I know I keep saying I'm going back to what I said. I'm going to freaking say it again. People want to partner with winners. They want to partner with people who have a track record. They want to people partner with people who they trust. When you have those things, especially if it's in one area, like one niche where you are so darn good at that area, you will get business. I promise you. People will pay top dollar for that expertise. Not you as the individual necessarily, but your business as a solution. They trust you first as the owner or as the, the vice president of sales or whoever the main contact person is, but it's not just you, it's the multiplication. It's the, the, the size of your team that can help their business go to where they need to go because they too are trying to make the right investment to grow their business. That's all I got. That's all I got. Whew, that felt good. Thank you for everyone out there who has joined me along on this podcast journey, who has been a lot, seeing the Portillo sales and marketing journey as well. It's been a great one. So grateful. I, I love you, dad. And, and uh, thank you for, for bringing me into this business. I'm, I'm truly grateful.